So here we go. First thing, would you each describe feminism, please? Rachel, we'll start with you. Okay, so um, the question of what we mean by feminism talking tonight would be a movement that started a long time ago under the, I would say, the uh, definition of equality for women, but it's gradually devolved into an emotional outburst now about anything that doesn't go your way almost. Like, if I don't like it, then I freak out because this is why feminism is important. So that would be like the women's march. The, um, almost anything you say today could be offensive because of feminism. Like there's a lot of ways you could offend people now. So I'd say it's grown from an original idea to something that's very vast and um, all-encompassing almost now. I think for many of you, you've been more influenced by feminism than you know because your whole life it has been a real... Um, growing movement and factor. Yes, all true. Um, I think historically, um, I don't know if you know much about the feminist movement, but it started first wave feminism, started honestly even before the Civil War, so like mid 18th, 19th century, so in the 1800s. So you're talking about women in hoop skirts, you know, and the like ruffly necks and stuff. They were wanting to have um, just like the right to vote, and they also wanted to make alcohol illegal. So those were kind of the two main tenets. So prohibition was kind of the first thing that the feminists accomplished in this country, and the right for women to vote. And first wave feminism was all about getting women the right to vote so that they could make alcohol illegal. <laughs> um, so that was their big victory. Um, in the 19th century, so that's first wave feminism, but... Say with their early slogan, oh, lips that touch oh, liquor well. shall never touch mine, it's yeah. Early feminist slogan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was one of their big ones. Um, then you kind of had World War I, and the world changed. Um, second wave feminism kicked off again in kind of the 60s, where you had everyone, you know, burning bras and um, demanding abortion. So abortion rights. Oh, they, you didn't know that happened. I'm sorry. It was kind of the thing of the 60s. Anyway, then <laughs> we got past that, we hope. Um, <laughs> it's not gotten better. No, it has not. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, so anyway, the second wave feminism, that's when they started actively demanding abortion on demand. So that's when Roe v. Wade came through, was after... So the, the victory for first wave feminists was prohibition and the right to vote. The victory for the second wave feminists was, was really abortion and Roe. And then now we're having third wave feminists, feminism and they don't even know what that's about because they're not even sure. I think it's gotten all tangled up with like transgender rights and like Rachel said, it's kind of devolved into anything that makes me unhappy. I can scream about and it's sort of become like it started as like very articulated in the 19th century and it's gradually become more and more of a temper tantrum mm -hmm. as time has gone on and like she said it really depends on who you ask this is a movement that's gone on for over a century it's spanned you know several continents it's not one particular thing and then if you ask like a christian feminist they're going to give you a different answer um, than if you ask like a professor of women's studies at a university, they'll give you something else. So it's, it's very, very broad. So I agree with everything you both said. Uh, I, I think the, a formal definition would be something like the advancement, the movement that tries, seeks to advance social, political, and economic equality for women. I don't know that that's originally what they would have said, but that, unfortunately, because feminism has, the, the way you can measure that equality is against someone else, right? So there is this bitterness at its core, because, and envy at its core, because I'm not getting what someone else is getting, and the not getting that is inspiring me to continue working and fussing, mm -hmm. but the, the problem you have with third wave feminism, actually, uh, what kind of makes me curious and interested, how can it maintain itself? Will feminine, feminism itself actually just fall apart? 
because if gender is fluid, then how can you demand that women have been deprived of their rights when women as a category makes no sense? And in fact, I was reading a website with these radical feminists who feel that they or maybe they can prove that they've been banned from various college campuses because they speak against transgenders. They say, look, you can't come and a man act like a woman. We're the ones who've been deprived of our rights and look at what you're doing. And the thing that is so distressing to them, in I think the most distressing thing or one of the most, is that all the sort of caricatures of of femininity that, you know, a lot of makeup and the really high heels and the short skirts and all that sort of stuff that feminists of the 60s would say you can get rid of all of that. What's the first thing a transgender person is going to do if you're trying to shift from a man to a woman? You're going to put on the makeup, the short skirt, and the high heels, and they are horrified. <laughs> How could you do that? These, these women were very, very upset. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I would add one other thing. Um, which is maybe an obvious observation, but just in case. Um, feminism is very different than femininity, despite the fact that those two words, you know, sound similar. So feminism would be the particular movement we're talking about. Femininity is just a woman who is being like a woman. And that's good. <laughs> that's the good part. Excellent, excellent. One more, uh, another question along that same line. What, do you, what would you say is the root cause of feminism? The root cause of feminism. Okay, well, I think Elise touched on that, that is discontent, but, or envy, or like constantly comparing yourself to someone else. And that's really all that's behind things like all the current fight about wage gap or something like, um, where it doesn't matter that women are more likely to quit or leave or need to go on maternity leave. And there are actual reasons why women can be more expensive as workers. It doesn't matter. If I'm a woman, I should get exactly what a man would get. Like, nobody can acknowledge that there are differences. That's the wage gap fight. Um, but I would say, um, basically, <laughs> the whole problem now with feminism is that it's moved into, like we said, just like a temper tantrum situation. I recently was in a conversation with a couple Christian, professing Christian feminists who said, Feminism is the radical belief that women are people too. That's their definition. Now, I challenge you, any of you, to find the most backwoods patriarchy man and ask him if he thinks women are people. And the answer is there, everyone believes women are people, right? There is no opposition to that statement. And when you start out with a definition that is like scornful, like, it's the radical belief. Like, it's like working, duh, it's into just your definition. It's just passive aggressive. <laughs> yeah, it's like wild. And so what I think it is, is like discontent and envy. Um, it doesn't even have to be envy of a particular person. It is unhappiness with what God gave you. You know, like it is discontent. So sometimes it's comparative. Sometimes it's just coming from your own heart. You know, like that this is, this is the problem. And I have told my kids, and I've told other people, all you need to know is in Psalm 100 that uh, it is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. And if you have that, if you believe that, that God made you and we are his and not our own, that the self is not something we conjure up from our own like desire, um, then that counters all of this, all of the silliness of not wanting to be a woman, not wanting to be a man, wanting to think you can just be a man one day if you want to. You know, like if we believe God actually created us. And I think that, that it is fundamentally a rebellion against a creator. It's a rebellion against the fact that we as humans, all of us, have a heavenly father. Like that there is God the Father um, and that that rebellion is like pushing against the fact that we have a creator father. Like that is something that we don't want to acknowledge, that that's what we're all doing here. You know, that the reason we're here. So that's what I would say is the origin is just rebellion. Yeah, I would totally agree. Envy seems to be a really driving force. Um, whenever you have your eye on what your neighbor is getting, um, then you're, you're automatically doing it wrong. So basically... If somebody gave you a piece of pie 
and you were all excited about it, and then they brought your neighbor a piece of pie, but it was a little wee bit bigger. Or it had whipped cream. Or had whipped cream, <laughs> or something. Then suddenly you compare what you just got as a gift that you were happy about, then you see what they got, and it's a little bit bigger, and then you get mad and you feel ripped off, and then you act like you've been robbed, like somebody gave you a piece of pie and now it's highway robbery what's happened. <laughs> and I think that that's basically the problem, is a lot of women got discontent with their role, they got discontent with the jobs God had put in front of them, they looked over at what the men were getting, they felt like that was better, um, just because it was different, honestly. And so then they started getting all huffy and demandy and temper tantrumy, and it's gone downhill from there. So I, I think I would agree with, well, I 100% agree with them. Uh, I, I think that feminism, well, the root of it is the fall. And I think in, in some ways it's like any other movement. It, anything besides Christianity is how can I make the most of myself? How can I bring glory to myself? So feminism is looking for how can women have more glory but apart from God? How can we have more authority but apart from God instead of how can we die to ourselves? And as long as you're looking to promote yourself, you're always going to lose. And as a movement, that's what they're, eventually it will lose. That's great. Okay, another question. So is there anything good in feminism? And, and let me say that since, since, all truth, it, since all truth is God's truth, is there anything good, is there anything truthful in the feminist movement or in any of the, idea, you know, the ideas behind it? Um, I would say yes, because there are some things that are inescapably true. So occasionally someone in the midst of a tirade against God may say, I have value. And that may be true, but it doesn't make the rest of the whole thing a good situation. So um, years ago, when I was in sixth grade and it left a mark on me forever, our teacher took us to the sewage treatment plant. <laughs> Guys, I mean, you're in town. You could probably go. It was in Pullman. Maybe you could ask for a special event. It was horrifying, but good. But good to find out what happens in the real world, outside of your little, your little world. And, and there's this just terrifying river coming in to the sewage treatment plant and and then a belt churning stuff i was like real bad like kids were getting sick and going to the bus it was bad but meanwhile the men who work there had a little lineup of things in the windowsill that they had snatched out of the incoming sewage like like troll dolls or little like anything children in pullman had flushed down the toilets <laughs> and so there's like oh look i found a 20 dollars bill and you're thinking you have got to be kidding me that you did that like how could you care about this that much and that is how i feel like much of this is like going to say show me the truth in feminism if the origin is really rebellion against god it's worse than the sewage treatment plant do you know what i mean like it's a worse place to be spending your time and diving around. So whether or not there is sometimes truth in there, there are much better places to find the truth than um, in the feminist movement. So yes, occasionally a feminist will say something that we would absolutely agree with. So in discussing something with a feminist, you say, absolutely, men and women are equal before God. Like with an equal is a Christian term for how men and women would be. Uh, the same or egalitarian, that's, that is where they often use those words the same way. So they say, if we're equal, then we have to be the same. So going back to like what Becca said about the pie, it's not though like a pie and a bigger piece of pie. It's like a pie and a tiramisu or something. You know, it's, it's a completely different thing. And then the feminists are trying to like, well, is this bigger or is this, yours is more colorful or this is more, you know, it's anything else. But the reality is we are equal before God and we can trust him he says that, you know, like he, he makes it clear that men and women are equals. Um, what, he, what is not biblical is saying that men and women are the same, that we are the same. And it's funny that that would even be a thing you need to, to discuss with people because we all know that men and women are not the same. You know, like, and, and praise the Lord they aren't, or this would be a very boring world if we were all the same. You know, not just men and women, but women are all equal to each other, men are, you know, like everything's the same. And that's the ultimate goal because they do think if we're all the same, we'll all then be happy because we all finally got 
what we wanted, which was total sameness. Do you think that the ultimate goal really is the sameness, or do you think, because it strikes me that they're, in a lot of ways they're trying to get rid of all the power structures, which they would describe as anything involving patriarchy, like marriage, mm -hmm. or those, and, and you can't just get rid of that, you have to replace it with something. A new authority. And it strikes me that they're aiming for an authority that Everyone's is the them. same but me. I, I will be that. in charge. <laughs> you can all be the same. Um, I think that that's definitely true, but I do think the stated goal is often sameness because that's a place you can get the most, um, you can get the most, what's the word I'm looking for? Sympathy from almost every human thinks that they have been mistreated, like somehow they have not gotten what someone else got. And so, um, in this conversation I recently had with a couple of um, real liberal feminists, one of the things that it felt like they were doing is just like metal detecting in my life for discontent. Like, is there anything I could find anywhere? And if we could get that, if we could find a place where you have a bad attitude, then, then we would have gotten somewhere. Like, if we could find that, then we would just love to fan that flame into something and we would love to do that. And so it made their, the things they were saying to me just wild. You know what I mean? Like they don't, they never met me. They'd be like, well, your husband doesn't even like you. He's just afraid of your dad. Yeah. And I'm like, thanks for the inside intel. You like, need to add to that. How tall is your husband? Yeah. <laughs> my husband is 6'6". Six, six. And for the record, he does like me. And he's not afraid of my dad. It's like everything about it is wrong. But then they go on to say something disparaging about having children when you could have done something else. And then they just ricochet around like wild. And at first I was thinking, can't they even stay on topic? And then I realized, no, they are. They're on a hunt for anything they could find where I would say, well, I do differ with that. You know, well, I don't think that's really fair. And then they would be like, ha, like, now we found it. We can fan it into a little blaze and pour all of our sympathy on it. So... I guess I would say that's mostly what is that underlying envy or whatever. It's, so I don't know, different, different goals for different people maybe, but the stated goal of the sameness is one that just usually can catch someone's heart a little bit. It's interesting that that's actually the abortion industry really feeds on that. If a woman can choose to not be pregnant, she can be like closer in sameness to a man. And that's actually a big root of abortion also. Yeah. And yeah. And when I was younger, there was a time when the big feminist brigade was, um, I don't know if they gave up because it was so dumb. I don't know. But it was all when we can finally have urinals in women's bathrooms, we will have arrived. And I think, <laughs> does any woman in the world think that my own, only my there. life would be complete then? What? They're almost there. But just yeah. for the men. <laughs> but yeah. only for the men using the women's bathroom. But the but, men but the point is, women. they pick the weirdest things to think are so symbolic of equality. Like, <laughs> like really? <laughs> I, would, I would say, though, your question about is there anything good or redeeming in feminism? Um, one thing my dad does say is uh, even a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. So it is true that the feminists do say some true things sometimes, but I would just say there are two things to remember there. Uh, the first is, is that when the feminists say something that is true, because yes, all truth is God's truth, they are not the ones who thought of it. They're the ones who just happened to agree with God for a minute. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, like, on accident. <laughs> on accident, most likely, yeah. The idea that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, the feminists did not write that. That was the Apostle Paul, and he said it long before the feminists came online. So occasionally, if they say something that's true, don't let them take the credit for it. Like, that's a Christian thing, not a feminist thing. So what they want is they want the footnote. Like, they want to be the ones that invented that. And it's like, no, you just happened to accidentally say something true because you live in the world God made. And when you live in the world God made, there are certain things, like water runs downhill and you can't fly, you know, on your own power and that kind of thing. And so sometimes they'll say something like that, but don't ever let them get away with claiming credit for it because it's a much older concept than that. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is I've talked to girls 
who will say things like, well, those first wave feminists, like, sure, I'm not into abortion, but like the first wave feminists, they said some true stuff. So wouldn't it be okay to just call myself a Christian feminist? Because I do actually agree with some of the things that maybe those first wave people said. And like, okay, I'm not on board with transgender and I'm not in favor of abortion, but some of the early ones. And I would just say, oh my word, no. Like, do not ever identify yourself with that because imagine that it was something else. Like, imagine if it was like a white supremacist movement and you happen to find something in the books that you were poring over, something that they said in there that was true. Maybe you might find something, I don't know. There is a God. There is a God, who knows? You might find something, but just because you found one true thing just like the troll doll at the sewage treatment plant, just because you found one true thing certainly would never make me say, oh, so I'm a Christian white supremacist because I found a true thing in there. Like, good heavens, no, don't do that. And so when you look at what the movement actually is, it is a really, truly God-hating movement. And they are, they are in rebellion against creation and everything they can reach basically they can't reach god so they're at war with his creation and so don't identify with yourself with that even if you found something true in there somewhere because you would never do it with other issues you wouldn't do it with white supremacy so don't do it with feminism so can i go real quickly back up back to the verse where paul says there's neither jew nor greek would you explain what that verse means like in um what is paul trying to say there just for clarification of not um, he's not, even though I've heard feminists actually use that, what is, what is Paul actually saying there? Well, I think the key is that first phrase, in Christ. Right. right. In Christ, um, it's not like he looks at you and says, oh, well, you're a Greek, so you're less than the Jews or whatever. In Christ, we are equal in our justification. We're equal in, in God's eyes on that. It doesn't mean we are the same as right? So going back to Rachel's point, there's a vast difference between equality and sameness. Those are not um, equivalent words. And it's very easy to confuse the two because they're related, but they are not the same. So you could have someone be equal with you before the law, for instance, like if, if I got hauled into court and he got into court, both of us would, would have the same rights. You know, we would have the right to trial by jury, we would have the right to face our accuser. Those are things that like we are equal in the eyes of the law. That does not make us the same in every other regard. It doesn't mean we have to have the same color of hair or the same income or anything else. Equality is very different. So I would just say, yeah, of course we're equal in Christ. Um, it's not like men are better Christians and women are lesser Christians or the Greeks were better and the Scythians were worse. You know, it's just, we are equal there. That doesn't make us the same. Thank you. Elise? Um, I was actually going to point out uh, one of the things Becca said, that it can be confusing because there are some things that feminists have said, these are important, that Christian Christians might say, actually, it is important that women are well-educated. But our definitions of well-educated are different, and the fruit is different. Are you producing... Be, because you might think, well, but couldn't I read what they're saying or couldn't I agree with some of the things they're saying? But they are not making you godlier and they are not becoming godlier by what they're, the way they're pursuing what might have otherwise been in the abstract a good idea. So there are ways to pursue justice and righteousness for people who really have been wronged that make you godlier, that make you pursue the glory of God rather than make you angrier. Yeah. Next question. Why do you think young women are so drawn to feminism, feminism in today's culture? Why are they so drawn to it? I, I guess I would say that young women in today's culture are drawn to it in the way you get drawn down river if you're in it. You're not necessarily attracted to it, especially not if you see it all lined up, you know, especially if it presents itself well, often you don't care for it. Um, doesn't look attractive, it's not what you wanted, but you are, um, so even in my, I'm, I'm old enough to be the mother of many of you, I'm the mother of one of you here, um, but in my entire life as a mother, 
abortion has been legal in our country, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in my entire lifetime, our country has said that women deserve the right to murder their children, right? Murder their babies. Women have that right, and we should protect that right, rather than women have the right to be protected while they carry their babies, right? Women have a right, they do, around childbearing, and that right should be the right um, of people looking out for you, not people demanding you have the right to kill your baby. But for my entire life, that means you all are like the second generation to grow up in that country, right? To grow up where you, where your parents may have never known a world where that wasn't legal and and um, esteemed, across, like like popular. And so you think, how hard are you going to have to fight? to not get swept up in that kind of current that is now a couple of generations old. And abortion was well into the feminist movement, and well into a lot of the real wrong-headed thinking. Um, so for you girls, I think especially, what the world is telling you women are, what they're for, what their gifts are, uh, what makes you special, all of the things that the world is telling you, like how can you find out who you really are, every single thing you hear from the world will be probably not good, right? Like almost all of it. Sure, maybe there's the occasional nut in there. Um, but if you think how constantly is the world telling you, you just have to believe in yourself. You know, like you just need to believe in yourself and then you'll know who you are. You just have to do, you know, there's a ton of incoming traffic. So the, the problem is, um, I don't know if you have to be attracted to it to just find out that you are a feminist. You know, like you might, you might not be attracted to it. If somehow you have resisted that, or if you have grown up in a um, community or a culture or your family um, where you have seen the lies from the beginning, so you have not started to buy into all the little petty things, um, if you haven't, you haven't ended up somewhere you never meant to go, you know, you, you actually are somewhere else, you will see that uh, it is like, I had these two feminists talking to me lately, and I will say I grew up in a home uh, that was really, really believed in uh, relying on scripture for our understanding of life, of who we are, what we're for. So it was not based on just what I heard all around. It was actively taught to me what to believe. So I would say I have a high resistance to feminism and I'm not interested in feminism. But these two women trying to sell it to me was the equivalent of like someone coming up to you on the street to try to sell you like a pilly beige unitard that is colored <laughs> like covered in cat hair and trying to sell it to you with great points like it's really unflattering and you just think why do you think I would want this like this is so ugly and sad and boring and yuck and why like what is this but the the problem is if you start believing everything you see in all the beauty ads early on, you know, like you're being fed things all the time. And if you just believe it without evaluating it, you may end up finding out you have a worldview you never meant. You may look down and be like, why am I wearing a beige unitard? That might be the <laughs> moment you have instead of thinking, please don't sell me this. Like I'm not interested. So I guess I would say you don't have to be attracted to it to be affected by it. You have to be not actively resisting this and not actively evaluating it in the light of scripture. Yeah. Becca? Yeah, I think that's totally true. One is you're just carried along in the current. Um, if you're not, you know, if you're floating in a river and you're just floating, you're still moving, right? You have to, in order to go the other way, you have to actively swim upstream. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's the world that you all are living in, is you have to actively try to go the other direction because everything, 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 from probably toothpaste commercials on up is trying to sell you this line. And so you have to really be on guard all the time. And so that's one thing, yeah, I think that's very true, is it's just the air we breathe, so you really have to be actively um, and consciously pushing the other direction with it. Um, the other thing, though, I think makes us susceptible to it is the cool shaming that goes with it. Mm -hmm. It is just so much. I mean, we all know what cool shaming is, and it can be anything. You know, it might be the shoes that everyone's wearing right now or the song everyone's listening to right now or I don't even know. Um, it can be anything, and you can be made to feel like the one dork in the room because you don't have 
the shoes or you don't have those glasses or whatever it is. And, and that pressure to be like all the other cool kids, that pressure is as old as dirt, honestly. I mean, it, and it just takes different forms and there's different things that are in right now or whatever. And um, being a woman who is not affected by feminism is about as uncool as you could be in our culture right now, like really uncool. And the funny part is, is that the rhetoric is that all the brave women are feminists, right? It takes guts and it takes bravery and you go do your own thing and be your own dog and don't let anybody tell you what to do, blah, blah, blah. It takes no courage in this country to be a feminist. It takes an awful lot of guts to go the other direction because of just the pressure that is brought to bear. So many, many women, um, they're embarrassed of the fact that they're just a mom, just a mom, you know, or just at home or whatever it is. It's not admired. It's not considered impressive. It's not considered virtuous or noble or anything else. Um, it's like, okay, fine, you have a couple of kids at home, but what I want to know is what you do that's important. You know, and so the thing is, is uh, like there's all this cultural pressure. And so I think that honestly, a lot of the time it can be our own cowardice that draws us towards feminism mm -hmm. is it's not wanting to stand out, not wanting to be the one person in the room who's just completely scorned by everyone else. And it really does take a lot of guts. And so I would just say, especially to you girls, is like, don't buy the lie that everybody's selling you. Like, this is what courage looks like. Because courage, honestly, looks a lot like going the other direction. So. It's interesting, really quickly to me, too, that the feminist movement's going on at the same time as the Me Too movement. And the feminist movement is going, I am woman, hear me roar, and the Me Too movement is, help, I need protection from everybody. <laughs> this is what I mean about the third wave feminists. Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. That's right. Because, <laughs> honestly, some of the old second wave feminists, like the Gloria Steinems of the world, you know, um, they're like, what on earth with the Me Too thing? Because... Yeah, they're, they're. Do you guys really, all know what the yeah. Me Too movement is? Oh, would you guys like to explain? No. <laughs> were you saying no, or were you saying yeah? We know. They don't know. They don't it's know. It's a mixed bag. It's a mixed report. <laughs> At least you explain yeah. it. <laughs> We've talked more. Because we hog the mic. That I. Well, what a great thing for me to explain to all of you. So, the Me Too movement, which I have not studied in depth, gratefully, is a lot of women who look for ways that they have been abused, and then they come and tell their stories, and the hashtag is Me Too, and what they're trying to do is build this camaraderie based on the places that they see that they were truly victims or that they think they were victims and might not have been. And it's... Yeah. We'll add something. It was very militant at the beginning involving taking down high-profile men. Mm -hmm. So it was... Oh, the Harvey Weinstein. And, and that's why, yeah, yeah, that's why there were some very legitimate horror stories of like, oh, guess what? You know, this producer, he was awful. I don't know what all manner of evil deeds he did. But finally, everyone who knew about it, which was an awful lot of people, decided to take him out and pretend that they were all the victims. You know, and Me Too. And, and he was um, a scapegoat in a lot of... Oh, yeah. Everybody knew. We're all trying to feel better about our own sin by having the occasional major pariah happen. But the Me Too movement was very militant. And it started out that way, revealing really dark deeds that someone did. And then it tagged on with people being like, Five years ago, one time, a guy spanked me when I was a waitress. Hashtag me too. Or, or like I was walking down the street and a guy whistled. What? Hashtag me too. Anyway, it's like it sort of went from, from the like actual horror show stuff. Like because there are genuinely women who are awfully abused. And, and actually where the Me Too movement got its sort of momentum was not even really in that group. It was women who had been complicit in a lot of ways, then decided to act as if they'd been wildly abused. There are many women who are, 
But anyhow, it just it turned into this whole big horror show, and then every girl who's ever had any guy look at her started me tooing all over the planet. It, it yes, should be said, true. just in the mix of this, that my brother stole if my you truck. have <laughs> been molested or abused in any way, there is godly recourse. Like there is ways to get help, to get to get uh, justice for what happened. It's just not in a hashtag. It's not in social fervor. Yeah. It's Facebook in, it's is in probably something not else. the place, yeah. and definitely it's not, not Instagram. There are other ways to do it, but it's not to belittle people who truly need help. It's just that it got a little out of control and schizophrenic. So, and a lot of. I think people feeling like they could really get healing or help for what happened to them by stating everything on the internet. There is almost no problem you have that can be solved by stating it on the internet. <laughs> well, that's right. I think too. Which are though, the best sunglasses? That have, could be it. Maybe <laughs> that's a good one. Too many opinions. But I true. think we've gotten to the place in our culture though where. Um, you have really won the prize if you can claim to be the biggest victim in the room. Like that has become a real winning ticket for everybody. And so everyone's kind of looking to get a piece of the action. And a lot of times, you know, there really are people who are truly victims and we know how we're supposed to treat them biblically. And but, they're, but they're the ones that lose in this whole scenario yes. because nobody actually helps the real victims. Everybody's listening to the person that, yes, that girl wore the same dress as you, but that is, you are not a victim. <laughs> <laughs> well, and a lot of times it can be like the soccer players, you know, who are flopping around on the ground and, and it's not really that bad. And a, a number of them are also just self-pity, uh, mm -hmm. trying to make up for the guilt they feel for things that they were completely complicit in. Yeah, All the right. ones in Hollywood are people saying things like, but he said I had to do this devious thing in order to get this role, so obviously I had to do it. <laughs> and you're like, no, you didn't. You could have not been a famous actress. You could like, have gotten a job you at could have, You yeah. could have yeah. looked for different work that did not involve you taking your clothes off. But in some ways, it's could just have. really sad to see this person trying to make sense of the shame, get rid of right. the shame and guilt apart from the gospel. And so if you look at it that way, is yeah, that, that's where you go. If you don't have the gospel, you look for every which way to get rid of guilt and shame, except for the one that will really deal with it. Or to get attention. Yeah, yeah there's sometimes that. Sometimes that's just as good. It, it can be <laughs> just as good. Um, the other night in the girls art in our small group, we were talking and I, I, I asked the question just because I think, I think we've all felt that way, but as girls, have you ever, and I loved your you talking about discont you know we can be discontent but as as young women sometimes we'll look at especially in high school looking at sports or looking at something going oh that looks like so much fun i wish i could do that what would you say to like are are men's roles better than women's roles i would gladly say men's roles are better than women's roles for men and <laughs> women's roles are better for women then men's roles are for women. And so there is that confusion of like just being envious, you know, just looking at what God gave other people to do, what you don't have. The, um. So I'd say no, women's roles are given by God for the women that he created, you know, and I, and I do mean here biblical women's roles, not like if there just happens to be some odd thing that's always been associated with women, like you're locked and loaded for life, you've got to do that or whatever. It's not that. Biblical women's roles, what the Bible actually calls women to, is better for women. And I do believe will result in a much freer, happier, more fulfilled life than any amount of pursuing something else will. And uh, I have been writing on Christian identity, so this is very relevant to this, but you'll have to bear with me for a second. When you say we are created, the Bible is very clear, we are created in the image of God, male and female, he created them. So it's not, we are both men and women created in the image of God. Um, when, and then the Bible also teaches that what we worship, we become like. Right? You make idols, you become like your idols. Like you become blind, you become deaf. You know, you, when, you, when you worship those things, you become like them. So when we worship God, we become more like God, which is, follow the little reasoning here, becoming more like the thing we were meant to be. Right? We were made in his image. When we worship him, we become more like him, which is more like ourselves. 
which means, and this is very counter every worldly wisdom, and like Becca said, even a toothpaste ad is trying to tell you otherwise. Everything is trying to tell you otherwise. Um, that you are most free when you are most obedient to God. Like, the most obedient you can be to him, the most like yourself you are, and the most like, like you are being what you were made to be. And so we tend to think, we import all of our expectations that the true free version of me, like the best ever me would be if everyone would stop holding me back and there wouldn't be social constraints and there, and there wouldn't be this and then I'd be free to be amazing and I'd be just so magical. Um, but the reality is that that's not true. That's a lie. Like that is, that is a trick. It's a lie. It's false. And so the more we embrace what God has clearly revealed to us in his word and the more we seek to obey him no matter the cost to us at that time, like no matter that, the more we obey him, the more like ourselves we become and the more free we become. So I say, absolutely, women, it's the best role for you to do what God told you to do. Yeah, Mr. Rigney talked about that this morning, that the more you pursue God as a woman, the more feminine you will become. And the more you pursue God as a man, the more masculine you will become. And I uh, just looked up on my phone because I couldn't remember it. Uh, G.K. Chesterton wrote a little poem that I love. Um, about what Rachel was just talking about, how different does not mean, you know, unequal. If I set the sun beside the moon, and if I set the land beside the sea, did you already hear this today? (laughs) You're going to hear it again. And if I set the flower beside the fruit, and if I set the town beside the country, and if I set the man beside the woman, I suppose some fool would talk about one being better. And so I think that that's exactly what you're saying. Our man's, you know, roles better It's like, well, that's just a silly question, honestly. When people get sucked into that, you're not going to get a good answer. Like, if you genuinely start comparing it like that, well, is the sun better than the moon? Is the flower better than the fruit? It's a silly question. It's different. And just deal with it. Elise? I think that a lot of times it can feel like if I can't have the same job, well, this is actually a, this is feminism speaking in our society, if we can't have the same job for the same number of years, working the same number of hours with the same possibility of promotion and success defined as everybody knowing you and you making certain amount of salary and whatever, then you have somehow missed out. And somebody was asking me the other day, well, do you think it's just not fair that women can't be pastors? And I said, well, in the same way that I think it's not fair that when I'm married to one man, I can't be married to someone else. Yeah, so are there constraints that God puts on our lives and because they are glorious, because they actually make something more beautiful? Yeah, it actually is better to be married to one person. I don't know this from experience because I've not (laughs) been married to lots of people. Multiples. Yeah, but you can have something beautiful and fruitful or you could demand having, be, almost demand infinity, infinitude, so that I can have everything that I can think of and you'll never have anything. Okay, what I'm going to do is open it up to questions for you all. And what I'm going to ask you to do is actually direct your questions to one person specifically. So let me, their names are, some of their names are hard, so even I'm struggling. So we'll just say Mrs. Jank, that'll make it easier. Mrs. Merkel, you can do, and then Mrs. Krapishets, it's a little bit easier than how I keep butchering Rachel's name. So, okay, Trin. It's good. Mrs. C, Mrs. C, Mrs. Jank, Mrs. Merkel, Mrs. C, Trin. That's much better. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm going to ask Mrs. Merkel just because she seems like a person to ask, not because favoritism. (laughs) We want this to be equal. You have to ask us all the same things. We are the same. Yeah. So um, Mrs. Lloyd asked a question earlier about um, at small groups about being envious of guys' roles. But I had a different spin on it. Um, What about us women who have been given skills that are more similar to a lot of men, so passion for debate and argument and activism? How do we accomplish that and accomplish what we were built to do while still being womanly and not feministic? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say the first thing is um, learn to do it like a woman learn to do it in a feminine way, which means don't look to the men as your model for how you're gonna do it. 
And oftentimes that requires creativity. It requires the ability to kind of translate. How am I going to do it? But the thing is, like, God loves diversity. He made us all different. And some women are, like, just naturally small and petite, and other women are really tall. And, yeah, somebody who God made really tall, she's going to have to probably work harder to look feminine than somebody he made really small. I don't know. Um, but everybody has their own challenges. You know, he gave you your own gifts and abilities. And if he made you six foot four, okay, yeah, you've got a challenge on your hands. But figure it out. Like, learn to own it. Learn to do it like a woman. And don't fall into the trap of thinking, well, the only people who are six foot four are men, so I guess I'm just going to have to wear men's clothes. That's just how it's going to be. Um, figure it out. And so I would just say, don't fall into the trap of thinking that, um, first off, I wouldn't say that those are just masculine gifts necessarily, but you could decide to exercise them in a masculine way, which I think would mean you're doing it in a disobedient way. So I would just figure out how to do it in a way that still embraces your femininity. So. Thank you. Next question. Titus? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to re direct my question to Mrs. Merkel because she's my rhetoric teacher. Uh, <laughs> for no other reason, I'm not biased. So, <laughs> so in today's culture, um, it seems like a lot of times that men, men have relinqu relinquished their authority in a sense, and allowed women to trot over the top of them. What would you say is the best course of action for a man to step out from underneath foot and take back their, their God-given right as a man? Okay, uh, that's a good question too. Um, I would say one huge qualifier that I would throw out there, which is something that conservative Christians have sometimes missed in the past, so it does bear mentioning, is that nowhere in the Bible does it tell women to submit to men. Thank the Lord. Um, I think we should praise him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It tells women to submit to their own husbands as to the Lord, which means you submit to one man, and that actually is a protection against having to submit to all the rest of them. So the that thing sounds, is... That sounds familiar, huh, guys? <laughs> Am I just being like the broken good. record? No, That's keep good. going. Okay. <laughs> Break that record. Could be. I don't know. So anyway... Um, it is really a mercy that women don't have to just submit to what men think, um, because I can't even imagine the chaos. Uh, but yeah, Muslim society would be a great example of, of something like that, where women are subservient to men. And that is not how the Bible has it structured at all. Um, on the other hand, you can step back and say the women, broadly speaking, have thrown a giant tantrum in the country and the men have sort of backed off and just sort of been like, well, that's happening. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, right. So I think that you shouldn't, as a Christian man, launch some sort of crusade to try and make women obey you. <laughs> because A, they won't. Uh, B, you'll be single forever. And, um, <laughs> And see, God won't be happy about it either. So I think um, the best thing you can do is to um, learn to be a godly Christian man and look for a godly Christian woman to marry and then act like um, the man God has called you to be in that relationship. You know, don't go around trying to assert your masculinity and authority and blah over feminists or something because that just is, it won't work. Um, so I would just say, learn to be a good man and then learn to be a husband who takes responsibility and who is the head of his wife and who knows what that looks like and it looks like sacrifice. So I would add one thing, even though you didn't ask me. Um, and that is- I'll let that, you talk. The, yeah, thanks. <laughs> the, the one area that, uh, that's more of a cultural anti-feminism place that Christian men can and should be involved is in being uh, vocally pro-life. Like, that is a place where men have abdicated to the screaming of women and let something happen that should never have happened, right? So this is one place that I think Christian men, while you're in no way commanding the obedience of women at large or something, you are taking a stand that Christian men should be taking uh, that is a gender, you know, gender-related. And that is one of the early, the rhetoric was, 
this is my body. Like that was the, the men whole have argument. no voice here. This is not your body. I can do what I want with my body. And so, yeah, men have been pushed out of the role of father, basically. Like this is not your arena. This is just me. And then also my doctor, like for whatever reason, we let the doctor in on it. Um, but <laughs> yeah, the one man allowed. Yeah. Um, and so basically, yeah, that's true. Like that's an area where men have been pushed out by the feminists. And so, yeah, taking responsibility um, for your own children and then being vocally pro-life. Thank you. Next question. Let's go over here. Well, I want to ask you, Ms. Merkel, because I heard you mention it the most, but um, you talked about a Christian feminist a lot, but you didn't really describe what a Christian feminist is and what makes them a Christian feminist. That's um, very true. Okay, so what makes someone a Christian feminist? And that's really hugely broad because you could have a Christian feminist who's basically like a Unitarian minister who doesn't believe in God. You know, you might have that on the one hand, or you might have a sweet Christian girl who just thinks she should have the right to vote so she identifies as a Christian feminist. You know, like it's kind of a major spectrum most of the time, though, I think the solid middle of people who say, I'm a Christian feminist, they want rights in the church the way the feminists got rights in the state. So the feminists fought for the right to vote and, and hold office. And what they're fighting for is the right to hold church office. So most of the time, the Christian feminists, they want the right to preach. They want the right to be elders. They want to not have to submit to their husbands. Most of the time, they, they'll go through all kinds of shenanigans with the New Testament commands saying that when Paul says the husband is the head of the wife, what he means is not the head. I just, you know, like I, they really go I through just a had lot of this stuff conversation, and, and it is unbelievable. It's almost like little kids saying, but it's opposite day. Yes means no. Because <laughs> these ladies told me that uh, what the Bible means by submit is resist. And you're like, so where did you get that from? Like, where did that come from? Or then, or then the same thing, the husband is the head of the wife. And they said, but did you know that the heart makes decisions and the heart is in the body? So actually the women are in charge. Like, is a lot of that kind of exegesis. And I do think Christian feminists are in a real pickle, to be honest. And this is something that, like, I think Christian teenagers can find themselves in the same pickle in a different department. But, um... Basically, like, you know how it is if there's a song that's popular, some kind of secular song that's actually quite bad, and if you were to stroll down and ask the pagan kids who like it, what is this song talking about? They'll be like, yeah, it's all about, you know, sleeping around and immorality, whatever. They probably wouldn't use the word immorality. Anyway, you know what I mean. They're like, yeah, they're like, that's how it is. I'm all about that. It's just, it's just how it is. And then you go and ask the Christian teenagers who all have a vested interest in having the song not mean that. And so they sit there going through all kinds of hullabaloo. Uh, trying, theme. <laughs> <laughs> or like you're just reading into it. It's not really there. If you ask the non-Christian kids, it's like, yeah, that's what that's about. You ask the Christian kids, they're like, you have a dirty mind. Anyway... <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, the thing is, is I think Christian feminists find themselves in the same sort of a pickle because they want to claim the Bible, but they also want to be a feminist, which leaves them like doing the splits weirdly. So um, basically, like if you just ask any old pagan, what does the Apostle Paul have to say about women? They can actually read it and see what he says. Whereas the Christian feminists have to go through all kinds of gymnastics to have it not mean that because have you studied early Corinthian cultural phenomena and stuff? It's just, so I think the short answer is I think they want the right to preach, hold church office, and not submit to their husbands, basically. Now? Oh, there we are. Sorry. I think you and I should, I should say, I'll just keep interrupting. <laughs> All right, so I would address my question to Mrs. Krapuchets. Um, yeah. Yeah, not. Oh, not such not a great Mrs. job on the name. Thank you. 
I, I, I've seen your book before, so oh. I, I, I had no idea you'd be here. I'm like, oh, she wrote Popes and Feminists. That but, uh, is very kind of you. Thank you. Cool. Um, so my question would be more specific. It's, so I, I, I know I have a friend who is professing Christian and also claims to hold feminism. What is a loving way um, and, and a respectful way to point out the, the wrong in that and um, how that is, as you said, rebelling against God? Or should I even do that? Is that even something I, I should do? Yeah, how do I approach that situation? And this is a, this friend is a, a gal? Yes. It's a girl. It's a girl. Mm -hmm. um, so what is, depends on, so how, just from a sort of debate standpoint, you want to know, how, is she committed to the Bible as what the Bible says, or is she... So some feminists, when they're reading the Bible, they would say, well, I actually read my experience is primary to what the, Bi the words of the Bible say. So it's most important to me how I've been victimized and women have been victimized, and that's how I interpret it. So if you have somebody like that, then they aren't actually committed to scripture. So you would probably want to know where that person is. But um, I would... I would say you would want to encourage this person to actually read her Bible and ask God to show her. I mean, at the end of the day, God really does delight in people following him and following him the way he, well, and becoming like him. So, it, it, and he uses his word to do it. So I would say that if she's reading her Bible and actually pursuing it, feel free to interrupt me and tell me that this you're good. Well, what are you going to say? Like, don't read the Bible, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible answer. But you know, have, encourage her to read and pray, and then you could actually discuss it. Or you might encourage her to talk to a godly woman you know, and she might have legitimate questions. She might actually just be confused and think that this is the most, the kindest way to treat all people like, oh, but it's really loving to want everybody to be equal. And, or she might really be militant, I don't know. I would add to that, because that's a great answer, but um, I do think sometimes there's the stereotype that if you're not a feminist, then you think that women can't be educated, they shouldn't be able to have thoughts, they shouldn't be able to learn to read and write. All they need to know how to do is have babies and make cookies. Um, while pregnant, yeah, while and pregnant, barefoot. yeah. And yeah. so, if it's she's important. like bought into that stereotype, then you'd want to like also, you know, like try and break some of those stereotypes. Where is she confused? What point is she con or is she not confused? Just mad. I would also add a quick way to figure out. And many Christian or professing Christian feminists will say they do believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. Like they would be like, "Oh yes, I believe the Bible is the word of God." So what you will need to do is push that a little bit with them and say, "Okay, so if I show you a verse, you know, like I asked these ladies, what is uh, what version of the Bible do you believe you have to obey?" Like, you tell me, what Bible, could I read a verse to you? And you would say, you're, uh, you're morally obligated to obey scripture here. And, and their answer is, there is no version of the Bible I will obey. Okay? Now, the reason is because they want to read a ton of feminist interpretation into everything. That the only reason it got translated this way is because there were chauvinistic men in the early church. And there was this. And, you know, there's all these reasons and there's tons of reasons. But the reality was that at the end of the long tunnel, if you keep following who's the authority, the authority is the feminist scholar of their choice. Like, at the end of the day, the only person they will obey is, is that person who tells them what to do. So if you find that out right away, you know right away that you're dealing with just a heart. Like, this is a gospel issue. Like, this person is not submitting to God, is not submitting to his word, and needs to meet Jesus. You know, like, it's, it's, time, to, it's time to have that talk. Well, one thing, too, I'd add, if I can add something. I grew up in kind of what I would call a Christian feminist home, and I totally get the oxymoron of that. But I think um, what you were saying about... Sometimes you have to swim upstream. Um, I would say she might be coming from a background where she just doesn't know that she's in the stream and has to swim upstream. And sometimes that's just a godly woman coming around you and saying, this is the right, 
this is what scripture is saying. Let me tell you what it's saying. And then doing that too. And just kind of understanding where they're coming from. I think is a big thing too. Another question. Um, so I have a question for Mrs. Jankovic. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you've ever had uh, a feminist actually change their mind in front of you. Mm, I, I don't, not that I can recall. We had one time many years ago, I've had feminists give their off the record opinion. Remember when we went um, to that? anti-Doug Wilson party. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we did that once. There was a time when our town was outraged about something, and I, and I actually can't recall what it was, but they were singing, we demand Doug Wilson to give an answer for this behavior. And it was like, we demand to give an answer. So the elders of our church were like, absolutely, town hall meeting. And then they all said, don't give him a platform. Don't go. Like, we don't want to hear whatever answer he thinks he has. So it was, it, they, they felt a little need to not go to the town hall meeting. So they threw an anti-Doug Wilson party at the brew pub or something. <laughs> so Ben and Becca and Nate and Heather and Luke and I all went to that instead of the town hall meeting. And we were, we were the skunks at the garden party for sure. But it was really great. These were people we had not ever met in person. They were online enemies. And it was they were very active and very hostile. But meeting them in person, you... It was really good to see who they were. It was sort of like if you had gone trolling the trailer park for the, the weirdest problem cases and got them all together, which is actually really good to see because you would have known from, from online, for all you know, they're a very polished, intelligent, I mean, you don't know who they are. So when we met them, we, I have had them give their off the record opinion of us. To be fair, they were very drunk. Oh. That's true. This is true. But we had a, it was a lesbian woman with a mullet and a, and one cross earring actually, who pulled us aside and said, kind of like off the record, since if you're Doug Wilson's daughter, then he's really doing something right. So can I throw something? It was in weird. Which is pretty funny. So we, I grew up in a, um, in a conservative Christian church, and but I had this uh, influence. I went to public schools, and I went to I actually went to a Baptist college that was great, and then I went to grad school. But the whole time, it's what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do that's important? Because staying at home isn't it. But then at the same time, it was like, but I want to stay at home. And so I would say, by the time I came out to Moscow, the influence of of Christian feminism on my life, although I wouldn't have stated it directly, was very, very strong. And the most compelling thing was to have, because I was confused and unhappy, and I knew it. And the most compelling thing was to have Doug Wilson say, I will not answer your questions until you repent of being bitter. I found this <laughs> appalling. I couldn't believe he wouldn't answer my very valid questions. But it turns out sometimes really softness of heart, hard words create soft hearts, as he says, and, and it does. Then there are legitimate, valid questions that someone can have about, look, this is what I've heard about the world, and it doesn't make sense, but I don't know anything else, and I don't, I don't want to make my own butter and wear a jumper and a bonnet. And so if that's my option, I'm really struggling. But... God really does repent, you know, many times you need to repent of your sin, and God really does call you to that repentance and then bless it. So the answer is apparently dad has seen a feminist I knew change you. before Come on. his eyes. <laughs> um, this is to, whoa, but to anyone who wants to answer it really, I don't know. Uh, do you think in the business world for women that they should be able to be paid equally amongst all same working class, and do you think that the feminists have the right to be upset at transgender men trying to be feminists like them? Go for it. You look like you. So the second half, you said, did the transgender men? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the Should second. The women be upset? Do you think they have the right to be upset? Do you think at they have the right to be men? upset? A transgender men. Ooh, well. 
I think um, not if they're doing it in a that's not fair, that was supposed to be for me kind of a way, because that's not a good attitude for any Christian ever. So I think that women ought to oppose the transgender thing out of principle and not out of a, hey, now you're cutting in line sort of a thing. Well, like I would add to that Bruce Jenner winning woman of the year or something from oh Glamour magazine. It's like, man, the women are really losing in this feminism gig. <laughs> <laughs> Even a man like, is a better it, woman than no, all the it's rest like of us. a middle-aged white man who's I know. been doing it wow. for six months. He's what? already better than He's us. He's the best of all of us this year. Yeah. He's just winning. But the, but the real point there is that he, what he won was no true glory. It was just glamorous woman of the year. What does it matter to a Christian woman, right? So, so your glory as a woman before God is never in, is never in danger with and, this. And on, uh, do you uh, want to say something about the wage gap thing? Well, it's not. You were probably going to say the same thing. It's you not true. Uh, yeah, it's the wage not gap is a lie. It's uh, partly it's based on a category problem. So, um, you would have the wage gap debate is that women are not paid as much as men for the same job. But what they would do is have these categories that included a lot of different kinds of jobs. So if you include a librarian and an attorney in the same category, which I don't remember if it's exactly that, but it's something like that, then it turns out there are more women librarians and more men attorneys. And, it, and so it's going gonna, it's gonna to skew your answer, right? So it's going to look like the men are actually making so much more. But when you look job per job and experience, so if a woman does come out of the workforce, it, the same as if a man changes a career, you know, he maybe doesn't leave the workforce in the same way that a woman would for having kids, but maybe he changes and does something else. He's not going to have the same number of years of experience, and so he's going to get paid less, just like she will if she doesn't have the same number of years of experience. Yeah, I agree. Like, if you actually look at the data, they're skewing it quite a lot so they'll have something to yell about. Um, but I also think, too, just that mindset is wrong for right. a Christian any time. Um, so, the, so the whole, like, hey, why aren't you giving me more is just an unchristian <laughs> attitude we are called to sacrifice and to give, not to keep an eye on what everyone else is giving to us. And so the golden rule is to treat others as you would be treated, not to make sure they treat me the way I want to be treated, which is right. sort of a weird, perverse version of the golden rule. And I think that that paradigm is what drives feminism, and I think that it is just wrong-headed at the beginning. So I don't think, like, and then you could address it from a sort of like a standpoint of free markets and stuff, but basically I would just say that attitude is wrong. I would add one other thing, which is that, biblically speaking, outrage and anger over something, uh, God does not want us doing that. So even a really righteous anger, you're told to not go down, not, not let the sun go down on your wrath. Like, even if something truly righteously outrages you, there should be no campaigns built on outrage. By, like, there is not a place biblically for Christians to be operating from a place of outrage, like organizing and and that is that. the fuel that powers the feminist machine. All of machine. the things like Me Too yeah. and all of these things. It's an outrage. Uh, yeah. It's an outrage farming technique. And they the wear Christians it as no a badge of honor. Yeah. Like angry. I'm so righteous because yeah. I'm so mad. You yeah. know, like, and Christians act like to be aware of social issues, you have to be angry about everything, which just makes you a disobedient Christian. Well, and if you, if you think about it just in a... Your brother likes to say, like, the person that's going to win the presidency is the one that you'd rather have over for dinner. And would you <laughs> rather have someone who's angry and bitter and demanding justice over for dinner or a godly, kind, jolly person? <laughs> like, probably the latter. <laughs> Hard to say, but... Okay, let's do two more questions. We have one back here. Um, regarding the women who have been unspeakably abused by men. Uh, many of them have been failed by the justice system. What would you say to a woman who feels as if joining or being a part of a Me Too movement or the feminist movement was her only way of fighting back or making a difference? Could you or just anybody? repeat the first part of your question? Regarding the women who have been abused by men. Who've been abused by men? Right. And have been failed by the justice, justice system? system? 
I, w I would say that you're saying, what would we say to someone who thinks their only recourse is worldly outrage on social media or something? I would say that uh, if you had the opportunity to talk to that person, it's the gospel they need, right? If they're looking for some kind of salvation or deliverance from shame or guilt or uh, anger or whatever, whatever it is, it's, it is straight gospel that they need. Um, if they feel like everyone else has let them down, there is one person who will never let you down, and that is Christ. And that is a reality um, that, that in Christ, all of us are uh, is as guilty as everyone. You know, all of humanity is guilty, and then all of us in him can have his holiness. You know, like on the, on the cross, he took all of our, every shame in the whole world and bore it, which means that he is the perfect, he's the only savior, but he identifies with us in our sorrow and our shame and our sin and anything, and, and he is a perfect victim, the only victim that didn't deserve anything that he got, and then there is victory through him, and that is the, that is the Christian message, and, and Lord willing, there will be Christians somewhere in those people's lives to share that with them. And I would add, too, that the Bible is not silent on the question of how should you behave when you have been badly treated and genuinely unfairly treated? And the only person who's been truly, as Rachel said, unfairly treated is Christ, right? He's the only true innocent victim. And look to him, like look to him as the example for how you behave when you have been badly treated. And he has quite a lot to say about it, as a matter of fact. And in none of the verses is he saying, if someone strikes you on the cheek, go start a riot in the streets. You know, it's like, there's actually a very sort of, you know, very spelled out take on that. And the thing is, is sometimes on this earth, there are wrongs that won't be righted until the last day, right? And then we know that every wrong will be put right. And it's true that we live in a broken, sinful, fallen world, and sometimes atrocities happen, and the justice doesn't come now but the justice will come, right? And so we know two wrongs doesn't make a right. Just because this person sinned against me never gives you a free pass to then go sin yourself. Your job is to be faithful and obedient to what God told you to do in the situation you find yourself in. And sometimes it's an awful situation, but the New Testament was written to people largely in awful situations, right? It's written to people who are about to be killed for their faith, who are about to be imprisoned, who are being beaten and falsely accused. There's a lot in the New Testament about victims and then how to behave. I would, I would add that sometimes people talk about Paul, the Apostle Paul, like he is so heartless when he just you know, he doesn't understand what it would be like to have been a woman in an abusive marriage when he says, wives submit to your husbands or something like that. But the reality is at that time, to the audience he was speaking to, probably, I don't know, what would you guess? One in 40 of those people may have not been sexually molested or abused. You know, like, well, think that's have optimistic. Have no Correct. Yeah, I mean, what, it was... yeah like, like forced temple prostitution. Like, that's who he was talking to. A culture that had, had all been... But in Jesus this. also was talking to prostitutes, and the thing is, if you're a prostitute, it's not some sort of, you know, nowadays people might say, some feminists will say, oh, prostitution is women's liberation. Right. Well, it, it was a slavery. It was a horrible situation to be well, in. Well, it still is a slavery. It is. Yeah. But at the, and there's Jesus not being shy about this is what I'm requiring of you. This is what I'm offering to you. I'm not going to kowtow because I'm giving you the only freedom you're ever going to have. Right. Last question. Um, okay, so this is for Mrs. Crappy Chips. Um, so you talked about how um, Christian women don't have courage, and that's kind of why they fall into feminism. Like, their cowardice is what drives them to that. So how would you, like, minister to a, to a woman? Like, how would you give her practical ways to be bold about what she believes without kind of creating a new movement or something like that? Because I feel like with the feminists, that's kind of what happened. Like someone started to speak up and then everybody followed. Like how can you do that in a way that doesn't create like another riot? You know, actually I think that's a really great question because it feels very much like if we don't do something right now and fix this, then 
we aren't really on top of it. But I think that's this revolutionary mindset that is not biblical. You do not. God doesn't look at something and say, if that's not fixed in two days, then it's all lost. <laughs> you know, It's and been so, quite a while since right. Christ, and things are still going along. And one of the things that I studied was the Reformation, which was 500 years ago, and the wives of the Reformers and the kinds of things that they did. And it was the little obediences, the taking care of their children, the being faithful to read the word of God, the supporting their husbands, taking care of the home when the husband was out traveling, having refugees stay in their homes, feeding people, just being servants that God used to change the entire culture. And nobody who was alive, and at this time, I should say, at this time, nobody knew if the Reformation was even going to be successful, right? So it's kind of like you're doing all this stuff, and it might all fall apart, and you're all going to die because it was, people were out for their heads. But even 40 years later, they might not see what are the real effects of that. It's 100, 150 years later when the entire society has changed that you see, oh, all those people being faithful in their own homes that nobody's you know, got their name on banners and doing parades for them, but they changed the world. I would say adding to that, um, she talked about the Reformation. We just had the, you know, 500 years of, since the Reformation. And I was, we were in the car. I was in the car with my children, and we were singing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, you know, coming back from Costco, whatever. We were singing a variety of things. When we started singing that, I had this moment where I'm thinking, can you even imagine, like 500 years ago, a man in Germany wrote that song, and what on earth would he think of where it is now? Like, in a country that had not been discovered, in a car, in a different language, still talking about his, like, still using his words to praise God. And you think, you know, it's normal faithfulness and it's normal obedience that, as, as the Bible is very clear, it's like a little leaven that leavens the whole lump. You know, like, he would never have thought, today I'm going to do some work to really edify the saints in Idaho on their way back from Costco. You know, like, that's what I'm going to put in the faithfulness today for. But I do think, too, that we tend to think that we have to use worldly tools to accomplish change. And when you look at the worldly sort of, like, here's the toolbox, here are the things we can do. We can call the congressman, and we can organize a petition, and we can start a march on Washington, and we can do all of these things. And those are all sort of drawn from the world. But honestly, God changes the world through the most unexpected means. And it's always what people didn't see coming, right? The world did not see it coming. And he can use women to upend things. Like, absolutely, women have so much power if they would just stay in the place God has them, has put them, and then be obedient there and trust that God actually knows what he's doing. Because we tend to look at it as like, well, my little life is so unimportant. I'm going to have to go out and start a march and buy everyone t-shirts or something. And it's like, actually, if you just do what God says to do, it's surprising how much that tends to work. And I would say it starts by now, you honor your parents, you know, you read the word, you study the word, you're faithful in worship, and you don't have a clue where that's going to take you. And one final thing, cultivate joy. When you will all face that, Becca talked about cool shaming and whatever, the most important thing is that you are, that you are ready to just laugh. You know what I mean? Like, you're saying mean things about me. And, and the feminists were, that I was talking to recently kept going off on these tirades against me. And this was in a message format. So whenever they would do this, I would respond with, in all caps, and I'm ugly. And then they would be like, <laughs> kind of like, what? And I'd just be like, you guys are so rude. You know, like they're just crazy rude. But it was like the fact that it was not making me angry that I was still laughing at them was like, um, just cultivating joy will actually change people's opinion, not getting shrill and upset trying to organize things. Well, thank you, ladies. Let's give them a round of applause.